We're joined by Dr. Daniel Popovich. He is the Catholic Health Director of Colon and Rectal Surgery at St. Francis. Dr. Popovich, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're talking a very important subject, something that's near and dear to your heart. It's colorectal cancer awareness. Uh, for someone in your position, this is something you, you care about 365 days a year, but uh, this is really an opportunity to, to raise awareness for people who may not be familiar with colorectal cancer and, and answer some of their questions today. So we appreciate your time. Sure, of course. The first question we received, uh, a very basic question, what causes colorectal cancer and what symptoms should I be looking out for? Uh, well, to answer the second question first, and I think most importantly is to recognize that the most common symptom for a colon and rectal cancer, uh, especially when it's early, is no symptom at all, uh, which is a very important point uh, as we move forward and talk about some of the other things in terms of when you should have a colonoscopy, you should not wait for symptoms. Um, but in terms of what causes colon cancer, uh, typically for most patients, most people, uh, more than 90% of these will happen sporadically. Uh, the inner lining of the colon called the mucosa uh, will transition into polyps and polyps will then be the precursors to developing cancer. And that provides the unique opportunity to move forward with the colonoscopy to screen for polyps and to remove polyps and thereby prevent colon cancer. Which leads into the, the next question we received. Is there anything I can do to decrease my risk for colon cancer? And that would be um, a lifestyle change, perhaps a diet change, anything that could help to decrease that risk. Sure. Uh, as with many cancers, uh, they respond, uh, uh, cancers can develop in, in patients who are overweight, uh, perhaps smoke. Um, alcohol has certainly played a role. Um, high fat diet has been uh, associated as well with the development of colon and rectal cancer. So living a, uh, an active, healthy lifestyle is certainly as protective as one can uh, be for the development of colon cancer. But going back to my answer to the first question, um, colonoscopy is the best way to prevent colon cancer. And in fact, we believe more than 60% of all, in, all colon cancers, even diagnosed today, could be prevented uh, if patients had had their screening colonoscopies and the polyps were found at an appropriate time. Uh, a perfect example of this, personally for myself, is my father. Uh, when he was uh, in his younger 60s, um, started to have symptoms uh, that made me suspicious that perhaps there was a colon cancer. And I was discussing with him if he had ever had a colonoscopy, and he said no. Uh, he subsequently went, got a colonoscopy, and was diagnosed with a colon cancer, and fortunately, he was able to have surgery and he's cured of his disease. But in his recovery, uh, he asked me if he had had a colonoscopy at the age of 50, which was the age back then, uh, would this have been prevented? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, a polyp would have been found, it would have been removed, and he would have avoided the development of cancer. So that is singularly the most important thing that any of us can do to prevent colon cancer is to get your colonoscopies. And that's our next question. It's just about the screening process. Um, do you need a family history? Should you wait for a certain age? I guess, what's the, the latest guidelines and what's your recommendation? So as, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the majority of colon cancers happen sporadically, uh, which means that it's without family history or genetic syndrome. About 90% of all colon cancers will develop that way. Um, it does occur. Uh, in 5% of the population, it is the third most common cancer in men and women. So independent of having a family history, um, uh, we all carry about a 5% chance lifetime of developing a colon cancer. The current recommendations for your average risk American who has no family history is to begin screening colonoscopies at the age of 45. No longer is it 50, the age is 45. And again, these are people who have no symptoms whatsoever. It's simply that you turned 45, it's time for a colonoscopy. For patients who have a first degree family member, your risk is increased. And we typically will recommend getting a colonoscopy um, either 10 years younger than the development of the cancer in that family member, particularly if that family member was younger than 50 uh, at the time of their diagnosis, um, or simply Let's say mom or dad was just diagnosed with colon cancer. You're in your 20s or 30s. Just get a colonoscopy. Um, you just make sure that everything is okay, no matter how young you are at that time. For 
for family members and patients who do have some genetic syndromes, uh, it's a little bit beyond the scope of our conversation for today, um, but for FAP or familial adenomatous polyposis or Lynch syndrome, you, uh, for FAP, you're actually gonna start screening for cancers in your, in your younger teens uh, and for Lynch syndrome in your 20s. Um, the other uh, people who have uh, significantly increased risk, again, first degree family members, uh, so those people are going to get their colonoscopies younger and more frequent, as well as people who have an individual personal history of inflammatory bowel disease like ulcer ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So you're going to start younger and more frequent with your colonoscopies as well. Regarding the screening process and colonoscopies, we did receive a lot of questions about the colonoscopy process. I think it's something, especially if you've never been through it before, um, you hear stories and one of the reasons we're here today is to kind of separate some of the facts from the myths. Um, one question, I'm scared of getting a colonoscopy. Is it really necessary and what should I do to prepare? I think you, you answered part of that already. This is something that's necessary. Yeah, it's absolutely necessary. You know, there, there are many other ways to screen for colon cancers these days. Um, you could do the Cologuard test. You could have a virtual colonoscopy, which is a special CAT scan. Um, you can do, uh, you know, barium enemas and things like that. Um, the point is, is that if anything is positive on any of those tests, you still need a colonoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. And only a colonoscopy can remove precancerous polyps. None of the other tests can. Uh, so colonoscopy is definitely the way to go. In terms of being afraid of it, well, you know, there are risks associated with every procedure. And as much as I would like to believe that in my hands, any surgery that I do is about as safe as I possibly can be, the risks of my surgery for colon cancer are certainly a lot greater than the risks of a colonoscopy. So if there's anything to be afraid of, it's not the colonoscopy, it's the development of colon cancer and the potential of the need for surgery. Um, so please don't be afraid. The biggest fear I find that most patients have, it's not really fear alone, it's just the annoyance of doing the bowel prep the day before. The colonoscopy procedure itself is actually a joy. You get a very good nap, you get to take the day off of work, and then you get the knowledge that everything looked good, or heaven forbid it found something, at least now you know what to do about it. That's a great answer. Hopefully that puts some people at ease. Again, it's, it's, it's a, it's a necessary process, but the way you explain it, it seems like it's a manageable process at that. Um, next question, if something is found during the screening process, um, what are the next steps? And I know that's kind of vague because it depends on, on what is found, but what would be typical next steps if say a polyp or something was found during the screenings? Great question. So for most um, small polyps or even average size polyps, the GI doctor, the gastroenterologist should be able to remove those at the time of the colonoscopy, especially if they appear benign. And then that specimen would be sent to a pathologist and within a couple of days you would know uh, whether or not this was just a polyp or if there was any cancer within. For larger masses that are uh, um, obviously cancer on appearance or smaller polyps that pathology resulted that there was cancer within the polyp, um, you would subsequently get that result about a week later. And then we would begin the process of trying to do the formal workup to ensure that the cancer is isolated to the colon or if it had spread anywhere. And that's usually done with some blood testing and a CAT scan. Um, at that time, usually with the diagnosis of a cancer and a colonoscopy, you're usually referred to a surgeon and we will usually help manage you and guide you through that uh, process of, uh, of the staging workup. For the vast majority of colon cancers diagnosed on screening colonoscopies, again, these are usually asymptomatic individuals. These are early stage cancers that are curable with surgery um, and should not instill uh, fear to the individual upon that diagnosis that nothing can be done. And we received some questions that are, are geared more towards your area of specialty, the surgery aspect, the surgery element, that's kind of what all of this is building up towards. Um, we talked a little bit beforehand, the surgery options have, have changed dramatically um, over the years. What are some of the surgical treatment options that are, that are currently available and that you specialize in at, at St. Francis? Sure. So for, for 
each colon cancer uh, or rectal cancer, depending on the area of the body uh, or the area of the colon that the cancer resides, the surgery is going to involve the removal of that portion and the associated lymph nodes with it so that we can properly stage the cancer. And traditionally, and believe it or not, uh, still more than 40% of cancers, even here in New York in, in this great uh, medical area are done via open operations. Those are big incisions from the breastbone down to the pubic bone um, and the, the tumor and the colon is removed. And although that absolutely takes care of the colon, uh, the colon cancer and adequately can cure you of the disease, the morbidity and the, associ the associated prolonged recovery with a large incision is something that I uh, and, and the other surgeons here at St. Francis try to avoid. And therefore almost all of our surgeries, almost every single one of them is going to be done via minimally invasive approach whether that's laparoscopic surgery or even robotic surgery, often with the same amount and size of incisions as simply removing your gallbladder. And for that reason, there's a significantly less, uh, a significant less amount of pain, a significant less need for narcotic pain medications afterwards, very short hospitalizations, often just one night in the hospital, and a very quick turnaround to being back at full health and going back to work often in just two weeks. And if you compare that to what used to be the standard of care um, years ago, or what still is being seen in patients who are having open operations, the difference is night and day. And following these procedures, what is the chance of you know recurrence? We have a few questions about you know will polyps come back? You know how likely is it that the cancer will return following surgery? It's a great question. A personal history of a colorectal polyp or a colorectal cancer is a very um, important predictor of the development of subsequent or what we refer to as metachronous polyps or cancer. Um, all of the cancers after they're re removed and sent to the pathologist are going to be screened for certain genetic mutations that will actually assess that likelihood of recurrence. Um, that being said, whether the tumor is stage one, two, or three also carries significantly important um, uh, risk associated with recurrence. Almost all colorectal cancers or even polyps, um, if they were to recur, are going to recur within the first two years. And therefore, um, we do very frequent screenings in our patients who had either polypectomies on colonoscopy or surgery to remove colon cancer with colonoscopies on a yearly basis for the first couple of years to ensure that there's no recurrence. Um, we do follow up with blood tests as well as CAT scans. And after the first two years, we will um, spread that out for the next five years. It's generally accepted uh, despite your stage one, two, or three or need for chemotherapy after your uh, surgical resection, that if nothing has recurred in five years, you are cured, um, but you would still have an increased risk over the rest of your life of developing a second polyp or a cancer, and therefore you will have uh, more frequent colonoscopies compared to your average American, which might still be every 10 years, you might need to have yours every five years. So besides, I mean, you talk about the minimally invasive procedure, it sounded uh, quick recovery. Um, and, and maybe you would have a colonoscopy every couple of years, but it, as far as long lasting impact following these procedures, it doesn't seem like there's much. I, there was one question about, you know, uh, whether you would need a bag or an ostomy following the surgery. It doesn't seem like there's a, a significant life impact after these procedures. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And it's still, um, just goes to show, you know, this topic of conversation, despite how common this cancer is, um, it still is not, um, talked about as frequently as I think that we should in, you know, commercials on television or discussions with your primary care physician, often because I think that we all tend to be private about our bowels. Um, but it still is surprising to me that the number one question that I always get from patients in the office when we talk about removal of portion of the colon is, will I need a bag? Will I need an ostomy? Um, and I understand the fear completely, but the answer is almost categorically no. There are very rare circumstances where there should ever be a need for a permanent bag. And there are very specific situations, almost always exclusively for rectal cancer, not colon cancer, where there should be a need for a temporary bag. Um, but it's, a, it's very uncommon. 
And you're absolutely correct. Once somebody has healed, um, after maybe a month's time, maybe a little bit longer for the bowels to reset to a new normal, um, just because of the change in plumbing, so to speak, uh, there really are very little long-term ramifications with this operation or with any colon operation. And hopefully this, uh, this conversation we had today will help people to understand ease of mind. I think, uh, you know, one tip that someone could take away is just to get screened, get your colonoscopy. That'll put you on the right path. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, if you are an average risk American, no first degree family member, no genetic syndrome, no other conditions that put you at increased risk, you get a colonoscopy at the age of 45 and there are no polyps, see in 10 years, nothing to worry about. That's great news. Dr. Daniel Popovich, Catholic Health Director of Colon and Rectal Surgery at St. Francis. We appreciate your time today. Thank you very much.